Every year, more than three billion air passengers head for the skies. The vast majority return safely to Earth without incident. But a small number experience life-changing moments they will never forget. It was like a war zone in the sky. We hear first-hand accounts from the passengers and pilots who have lived through the most shocking extremes of air travel. The plane just sunk like a stone and crashed into the ground. From great escapes... Run, run, it's gonna blow. ...to mad moments and crash landings without wheels. We had no landing gear, so we're coming in for a belly flop landing. Or runways. Holy! It's definitely something I don't teach in driving school, so I'll avoid a plane. In the age of the smartphone, these events are caught on camera as never before. Awesome. We reveal exclusive footage never seen on television. So keep your seatbelt fastened for the world's wildest flights. In this episode of World's Wildest Flights, a deaf traveler's terrifying experience when a New York plane crashes. There was so much smoke and we couldn't see where the fire was coming from. The passengers forced to pay for their own petrol to get home. We felt we were being held to ransom. And a pilot's close shave with death on a Reno runway. I went on the wildest teacup ride you could ever imagine. September 2015, Las Vegas, USA. Ellie and Paul Waldridge from Essex in England are in Las Vegas to celebrate both of their 50th birthdays. It's been the holiday of a lifetime. We had a lovely time. David Copperfield, Cirque du Soleil, the Bellagio, fountains, everything. It was really good, really, really good. Just an incredible place and... Uh... So we're not really looking forward to coming home, but you've got to come home at some point. All parted out, the couple head to Las Vegas McCarran Airport to catch their British Airways flight back to the UK. Everything was just fine. We were just sitting in the airport lounge and I see the BA pilots come in and I think, mm, they must be ours. Didn't think no more of it. Little did I know he was going to be the man to save our lives. Chris Henke, a seasoned pilot with over 40 years flying experience, is the captain of the Boeing 777 that day. Well, it, it began, it was all, all fairly standard. Um, <clears throat> the checks were fine, uh, passengers boarded, I think we left on schedule. There was nothing untoward at all. At 15.53, the plane pushes off from gate E3 and 157 passengers prepare for takeoff. So, so uh, we watched the safety talk on the video screen. Uh, always take a bit of notice of that because you, you never know what's going to happen. They tell you where the exits are, should you have to get off in an emergency. Mine was right behind me. Once we left the gate, we just taxied out. It's a big airfield, um, Las Vegas, very big. So there wasn't hardly any traffic around. You taxi onto the runway and you're literally just thinking about getting home seeing my dogs, seeing my kids. And you sit there and you wait. There's always the wait before they get their signal that they can go, and then you hear the engines. And then we got clearance to take off. The plane starts to accelerate down runway 07L. But after just a few seconds, it's obvious that something is very wrong. And then all of a sudden, I, I felt a jolt. There was a bang. Uh, initially, we thought it might be a tyre had blown. The plane sort of listed to the left bit, and so I, I immediately looked out the window, and I could see like flames and that in, in, on the runway. And I remember it was like um, the film Back to the Future when the car takes off, leaves them two wispy flames. It was just like that in the runway. At the point the pilot realises there's a problem, the plane is hurtling down the runway about 90 miles per hour. He needs to make a life and death decision, continue with one engine or abandon the takeoff. 
The crucial factor is whether the plane has reached its V1 velocity. V1 is a speed which is calculated before departure, um, depends on such factors as airfield elevation, temperature, um, weight of the aircraft, etc. After that speed, you'd still be able to continue with the takeoff run to achieve flying speed before the end of the runway and continue uh, takeoff and flight on one engine. Prior to that, if you were to have an engine failure on a twin engine aeroplane, you'd be able to stop. The V1 speed for this aircraft in this location is about 180 miles per hour, so the pilot aborts the flight as soon as he realises there's a problem. We were called stop and uh, go through the actions, uh, reverse thrust, brakes, and then, then you assess the situation. The plane stops on the runway, but no one really knows what the problem is yet. It isn't long before the passengers start to panic. You can hear the click, 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 click of all the seat belts. Everyone's getting up because they're wondering what's going on. The stewardesses come down, sit down, sit down. It's only a burst tyre, it's fine, don't worry. So we're just sitting there and waiting. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated. 30 seconds later, just another boom, and the engine bursts into flames again. That's when panic set in, because basically you're sitting on a, I don't know, a 300 tonne bomb. Whatever the plane weighs with 12 hours worth of fuel on it, it's, you know, it's just a massive, massive bomb waiting to go off when it's on fire like that. So uh, I just wanted to get off there as quick as we could. The passengers in the cabin are aware of a fire raging in the engine, but the pilot can't see the blaze from the flight deck. He may at a very stretch just be able to see the wingtips if he puts his head right up against the window, but he certainly can't see the engines at all. The only way the captain can see what's going on is from the smoke which is now billowing out from the burning General Electric GE90 engine. The only thing we could see was there's like a grey shadow because the sun was behind us. So we had no idea of, of the severity, but uh, we had to do the, the check for the, um, the fire warning, which we did. And then I asked the other co-pilot to go back down the back. We could hear some screaming and shouting. Uh, just to check out what was going on. And then you see one of the pilots run down and he looks out the window and then he runs back. He said, I believe it's bad. And I said, how bad? And he said, very bad. <laughs> so uh, from that, I, um, you know, he, he's an experienced pilot. Uh, and if he thought it was very bad, then that's good enough for me. And, uh, and it was time to get off. And then all of a sudden, it's the emergency evacuation, emergency evacuation. Oh, I just started panicking, and I'm, I'm thinking, no, no, oh, I want to see my kids. I'm not a nan yet. I want grandchildren. And I really thought that like, I was going to die, because you just think this plane is full up with fuel, and there's a fire. It's just going to blow up. September 2016, Reno, Nevada. The 53rd National Championship Air Races. Nearly 200,000 spectators flock to see the fastest motorsport on Earth. But unbeknown to them, this year they will also witness one of the greatest escapes in air racing history. As a youngster, Swedish-born pilot Tom Richard dreamed of competing at the Nevada event. When I was seven years old, I read an article about the uh, 1979 Reno Air Races, and I'd never heard of anything of the sort at that time, and thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen, and I decided that's what I'm gonna do. At just 16, Tom took to the skies, working his way up through gliders, helicopters, and even vintage fighters. But his heart was always set on competitive racing. Air racing is about the coolest thing you could ever do in an airplane. So it was a natural transition for me to strive in that direction. And I always tell people, be careful what you wish for, because it just might happen. And uh, in my case, I ended up uh, uh, air racing in the Formula One class first in uh, 2008. And uh, um, it's been a tremendous ride and a ton of fun and don't regret a second. Founded in 1947, Formula One is the oldest pure racing class of aviation. Specially designed planes are very small and very fast. 
It consists of very tiny airplanes. They uh, weigh just over 500 pounds, so that makes them real hot rods. So we have a lap speed well over 250 miles an hour, 50 feet off the deck, racing around, trying to see who's going to finish first with your hair on fire. What could be better? Tom got his first taste of success from the beginning when his custom-built Formula One plane, Hot Stuff, was the winner of the first ever Air Race One World Cup in 2015, after placing at the top of the podium in Reno, Spain and Tunisia. Hot Stuff is a one-of-a-kind, all-carbon fiber, custom-built air racer. It's not good at anything else, but it goes really fast. It's certainly not uh, very comfortable. It's a very, very tight airplane. It's actually made around the body and uh, you just kind of snap your shoulders in place when you get in it. It's, uh, you have uh, an inch and a half to move your head either direction. If you're claustrophobic, it's probably not for you. The following year, Tom is hoping for more success as he takes to the skies in Reno, racing hot stuff in the Formula One class. He's doing well in the preliminary rounds, but everything hangs on the final at the end of the racing week. The entire week of Reno is the build up to Sunday. It doesn't matter where you place through the week. The only thing that matters is where you finish on the day of the final. Reigning Reno Formula One champion Steve Senegal is competing in his plane, Endeavour. Well, the gold final is the big deal. That is the, the finale of the race. Um, I had been doing well. Um, I had won the year before that, and so I was expecting to win this year as well. Mark Tukers is crew chief for Naughty Girl another one of the planes lining up for the big race. The gold final is a big deal. That's where all the bra bragging rights come from for the rest of the year. Um, everybody has tuned their airplane to the peak. Now's the time to put it on the table, and, and we all do. I was in slot number four, which was the second row on the left side. So I had three airplanes behind me, um, one on the left, one on the right, and one on the center line. Naughty Girl is to the rear of Tom to the left. Because we had had some, um, some snags during the week, we had to start from the back row. And Endeavour is just behind Hot Stuff. I had been assessed a technical penalty in the race before, and so I ended up on the back row. Once we're pulled out on the starting grid and we get a 10-minute warning, we're allowed to start the engine. So I'd started my engine probably at the five or four minute mark, and it seemed to be running OK. And then uh, at uh, two minutes before the flag drops, all the crews have to vacate the runway. So we did, we got into our car, we all got um, in the right spot, the camera's rolling and we were waiting for the start. Once I got my engine running uh, and revved it up, I realized it started cutting out. It was impossible to fly the engine like that. Obviously, it wasn't safe. I was forced to shut down and get myself out of the race. I simply just pulled the fuel, and as soon as the propeller stopped, that signals the flagman that uh, I need to be pushed off to the side. Once I shut my engine down, I started opening my canopy. Tom is out of the race and needs to be towed off the runway fast. The only problem is nobody told the starter at the top of the grid. The plane came down, I gave it power, and I started rolling. We see our aircraft start moving. We start accelerating the car that we are in to try to film him. Much to my surprise, the airplane next to me started rolling. At that point, I realized that somebody had started the race. I raised my canopy as high as I could to make myself as visible as possible to the three airplanes behind me. I race a tail dragger where the tail is down, the nose is up in the air, and it's blocking my vision ahead of me. Noticed that Hot Stuff was not moving. In fact, had his canopy open, which is why I panned back to Endeavour. I knew there were three airplanes behind, two fast starters on the outsides, and they flew by me pretty quickly. And then I heard the third airplane coming up towards me, but I figured he would overlap my right wing. I did not think he was going to hit me. As we start rolling, the tail comes up and I'm able to see the field in front of me. But it was a very a short time when I saw him until I hit him. It was a loud bang and I went on the wildest teacup ride you could ever imagine. Oh! 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 
I flipped a 180 on the runway. And all I could do at that point was just pull my arms in and try to protect my head. I knew I'd been hit. I didn't know how bad. I was just trying to stay still so I wouldn't hurt myself any worse. I actually went over and spun around. Uh, but that was uh, the only thing that was going through my mind was you know trying to control the airplane. It was obvious Steve Senegal in Endeavor was fine. He just spun on the runway. Tom, on the other hand, was impacted by the gear, which made me fear for his head and well-being. You okay? Backed off! My right hand was struck by his left wing, and it was a bit like getting hit by a baseball bat. That's what it felt like. You all right? Uh, my hand is hurt. OK. I didn't want to take my glove off, because I expected it to look like a bag of chicken parts, basically. So I crawled out of the harness. And uh, eventually got to the medics and we took the glove off and it turned out that I had a severely bruised and uh, sprained hand, no broken bones at all. I did see Steve running over uh, to Hot Stuff. That was great to see. And I could see that uh, Tom was nursing an arm, but he was walking by himself, so he seemed quite well as well, which is a heck of a relief for everybody. Remarkably, neither of the pilots suffered any major injuries, but Hot Stuff wasn't so lucky. My aircraft was hurt pretty bad. Uh, it received three or four slices from his propeller. The left land gear actually dislodged the entire wing from the fuselage. The top of the vertical was taken off by three or four inches. Then, of course, the canopy flew off the aircraft. For some miraculous reason, it didn't touch my propeller somehow. And uh, that was about the extent of the damages on my aircraft. Unfortunately, Tom and his team were not able to compete in Reno in the 54th National Championship Air Races. Uh, 2017 will be the first year in 10 years that I'm not racing because both my airplanes happen to be uh, down for maintenance. So this year, you will see me in Reno, but I'm only going to be racing a golf cart. But it won't keep him down for long. He'll be off the golf cart and soaring through the skies as soon as possible. Accidents happen, whether it's aviation or something else, you know. Uh, we always have to take risk. Every day is about risk. I choose to cross the street because I want to see what's on the other side. That's a risk I'm willing to take. I'm willing to race airplanes because of the rewards it gives me. And we'll build another airplane, we'll race another day. That's the point, right? July 2013, Nashville, Tennessee. Aidan Mack, deaf blogger and entrepreneur, is on her way back to New York after an expo in Florida. Her connecting flight at Nashville International Airport makes a routine takeoff. After years of flying, she has got used to understanding cabin crew's instructions, even though she can't hear what they're saying. I've flown frequently, and I can see by their bodies and their behavior that they're making an announcement. You can absolutely see from the visuals that this is what's happening. Dancer Franklin Lorenzo is also on the flight, heading home to New York after a performance in Houston. Franklin was never a nervous flyer, but perhaps this time he has a premonition of what is to come. I, I was with a friend who was sitting next to me, and I told him, it's funny how these devices just take off and fly, being so heavy. And I recall saying, but when they go down, they go down. But as the plane travels from Tennessee to the East Coast, there is nothing out of the ordinary about this journey. And Aiden is on familiar territory, interpreting the cabin crew instructions as the plane makes its final approach to LaGuardia. People put their seat backs and trays up, and I know that I know the routine. And when I see those behaviors, I know that the flight is about to land. But when the plane approaches the runway, everything changes, and the passengers start to sense danger. As we're coming in, the speed increased of the aircraft, and the aircraft started to tip forward, which was concerning to us, because that's not how an airplane lands. All of a sudden, it started crashing downward. We're descending at an incredible rate. Half asleep, Franklin misses the drama. That is, until he's abruptly awakened. As we were making the approach, I had my eyes closed because I had not slept well. And then before I knew it, we hit the ground. The impact was extraordinary. 
spent almost 15 years as a firefighter and I've never experienced a, a sensation like that. The phone went on the floor in my head. I managed to stop it with my foot. Then I grabbed it and I started filming. All of a sudden, the plane was just uh, moving in these odd directions. So clearly, at that point, we all knew the landing was not normal. The landing was far from normal. The pilot had touched down at such a speed on the front undercarriage that it smashed into the body of the aircraft. The 737 then careered over 2,000 feet along the runway before grinding to a halt in a tangled mass of metal. The problems had started during the initial approach. The first officer at the controls at the time had set the flaps at 30 degrees instead of the correct 40 degrees, and the plane came in far too fast. The aeroplane should be established at 1,000 feet, with the landing flaps down, gear down, the speed right in the groove. It obviously wasn't. Despite this error, the captain, who has the ultimate responsibility for the aeroplane and its passengers, did not take over the controls until the plane was just 27 feet above ground. He was going too fast, trying to put the aircraft down on the runway instead of carrying out a go-around. What's a go-around? A go-around means you actually take off again in the air. You apply power and just start to climb away again, back up to a suitable height, advise air traffic control, and come round for another approach, this time better. I suppose to go around for some people, it could be a loss of face. In other words, you know, I've made a, an error and everybody knows I've made an error, so I'll carry on and try and get a landing out of this. As a consequence, the plane hit the runway at an incredible speed. The only way she could put that aeroplane on the runway was to put it down nose wheel first. And they're not designed for that at all, which is why it gave way, collapsed and broke into the aeroplane. The 737 careered along runway four for nearly 20 seconds, to the horror of the 145 passengers. I think the gears had gone under, and so we were just scraping along the ground. The plane finally came to a halt, resting on the nose, leaving Aiden in the chilling position of being stuck in a crashed plane with no reliable form of communication from the 737's crew. As a deaf individual, I couldn't hear what was going on, so I was watching my back and making sure that I could get out because we know how people will panic. So I was keeping my eyes on everyone in order to survive. British Airways Flight 2276 to London was approaching takeoff speed on a Las Vegas runway when one of the fan blades in the high pressure compressor failed, blasting out fragments into the left hand engine, which exploded into flames. 157 passengers, including British holidaymakers Paul and Ellie Waldridge, are still on board the fully fueled Boeing 777 while the fire rages. I looked to the right, and the, the engine was just a massive fireball just complete fireball, and I said, God, this plane's gonna blow up. Set the evacuation alarm going, so that sets the motion for the cabin crew to get the passengers off. Uh, and then I did a mayday to the tower, uh, asking for the fire services. I didn't have my shoes on, I'd left them where they were, everything was left where it was, and I was at the back door, and the steward opened the door, and we just waited. The cabin is quickly filling with toxic smoke as Ellie and husband Paul suffer an agonizing wait for the escape chutes to be activated. The chute come out. I was first down. <laughs> I didn't wait for Paul, I was first off. So we come down the slide and we got to the bottom and I just, without swearing, I just said to her, run, run, it's gonna blow. Because, you know, it's taken off, it's got 10, 12 hours worth of fuel on there. It's just a massive bomb, really. We, we was literally running for our lives. I can remember my feet just burning because I had my flight socks on and it was only like four o'clock in the afternoon out there and it's burning hot and I can, my feet are burning, on, my feet are burning. But I was just running. I've never run so fast in my life. 
Paul and Ellie abandon all of their possessions as they rush to escape the stricken plane. We, we left all our stuff on there. I mean, we left hundreds of pounds of stuff up in the cabin. But, you know, that, that's nothing compared to your life, is it? Just get off that plane as quick as you can. Yeah, we, we didn't bring nothing down there. But not all the passengers are quite so sensible. You can see that the passengers were taking their baggage off with them, and it's possible to see that on this film. That's a definite no-no. Well, the, the reason people shouldn't take the bags off in an evacuation is because it causes a delay. Uh, while they're reaching up into the overhead locker, that's a delay. You know, it might be five seconds, but that can, can be a matter of life and death. With no luggage, Paul and Ellie quickly flee the danger zone and look back on the horrifying scenes unfolding as the engine continues to burn. When you think you're far enough away from it, you just turn around and just watching it and you're still seeing people coming off of it. And you're thinking, how have I got off of that? Like, there's still people on that plane. As the passengers continue to slide down the escape chutes, they are far from safe, with the plane still at risk of bursting into flames. Routine emergency processes normally prevent the fire from spreading, but in this case, the damage to the engine means that fuel is still feeding the fire. When we get the fire warning, one of the things involved is pulling a fire handle, which actually shuts off fuel, hydraulics, etc., to the engine. If you had a normal fire, and fire the fire extinguisher as well, should be enough to put the fire out. But because this was catastrophic, um, those fuel pipes had been split open. So the fire was being fed by residual fuel. And the risk is that the fire will spread throughout the plane and even into the path of the fleeing passengers. The wings are fuel tanks, that's where a lot of, most of the fuel is kept. And if you have an engine which is below the fuel tank on fire, and that could set light to the fuel tank. And it could go in any direction uh, where the people are trying to get off, and they could be trying to evacuate into flames. Thankfully, in this case, the Las Vegas Fire Service arrive within two minutes of the plane coming to a halt and cover the engine and much of the rest of the aeroplane in flame retardant foam. Their quick work ensures that the fire does not spread and potentially cause much more serious problems. As they bring the fire under control, Chris and his team make their final checks in the flight deck. By the time we'd, we'd done that, then the cabin manager come up to the flight deck, said everybody's off, and that she was getting off as well. Chris and his two co-pilots are the last people to leave the plane. We were checking that basically everything is shut down uh, and it was safe to get off. There was smoke everywhere, uh, but then we we went down the same slide. Uh, by the time I went down, they actually sprayed it with foam, so it was very slippery and uh, I went down extremely quickly. But uh, th then it's getting the passengers together and so we could count them and make sure everybody was there. Chris and his crew checked that all the passengers have safely evacuated the plane. But for many of the unfortunate 157 British Airways customers caught up in that terrifying situation, the effects will last long after that day. November 2011, Amritsar, India. Nearly 200 visitors from the West Midlands in the heart of England have flown out to the Punjab on newly established airline Comtel Air. Many of the passengers are British Asians back in the old country to visit friends and family. Amongst them is Birmingham-based Lal Dadra on his regular annual visit with his family to see relatives back in India. Our family holiday was fine, but it was just obviously getting back, which was the, which was the big issue. Kamal Paul from Kettering is flying over for a friend's wedding. So I did all the touring and after 12 days I said, well, thank you very much, it's time for me to go home. The flight out to India had been Lal and Kamal's first experience with Comtel Air, a small Vienna-based airline. It was fractionally cheaper than the other flights that were available. Uh, I think it was only cheaper by £50 per person, but well, there was three of us going at the time. So as a family that was £150, which we thought, you know, we could save. Little did we know we'd be spending so much more. Journey out there was fine and we arrived in Amritsar. Um, no problems, collected our luggage at the, uh, at the other end. 
and um, got off and headed off towards our functions. But as Lal and Kamal prepare to head home, they have no idea what's in store for them. They return to Amritsar Airport to find the Comtel Air departures desk in chaos. Everyone was just like walking around, all confused, saying, oh, the flight's cancelled. We were like, what do you mean the flight's cancelled? We were asking the people at the airport, they didn't have a clue. They were like, look, the flight's cancelled, go home. We were like, well, when, when is it going to be rescheduled? They didn't have any information for us. We requested five hours ago. And each time we went, the people at the airport said, the flight's not going ahead, go home. So we had to go home. And then the third time, they did say that the flight is going to run. We were just relieved that the flight was going. So even though it was the late 10 hours, we were still optimistic that at least this flight is going to go. And when the flight took off, we were relieved that like, finally we're going home. It was like winning the lottery, to be honest with you. So remarkably, and to everyone's great relief, the Boeing 757 finally leaves Amritsar. But they are not back in Blighty yet. And their relief is short-lived, as the airline makes a routine fuel stop at the airline's base at Vienna Airport. We were expecting just a 30 to 35 minute stop over as the aircraft refueled. Um, but an hour passed and then we will start getting a bit agitated because we already had so many problems with this particular flight. And the passengers are right to feel agitated as the journey takes a very strange turn. The cabin crew announced that the airline had run out of money and the only way that we could go back to Birmingham and return was to cough up, I think it was £24,000. You want to go to Birmingham? You have to pay. We can't do anything else. Basically, she's saying that if you want to get home, this flight is now going to cost you, in fuel, £24,000. We felt we were being held to ransom. Stuck as a virtual hostage at Vienna Airport with a £24,000 price on his head, Lal decides he needs evidence of this airside extortion attempt. At the time, I had my camera on me, and I, my first instinct was to film what was going on because I didn't think anyone would believe us if we actually went home and told them this happened. But the Comtel Air customers are left with very few options. We were just absolutely outraged. Everyone was like, what can we do? Uh, but we realised that this was seriously the case, and the only way we could do this was to get the money. Uh, a lot of people were crying, a lot of people were so worried. But we were just, uh, there's only one way we can get out of this, and we have to raise the dollars. Kamal is one of the shell-shocked passengers, marched into Vienna Airport by Comtel Air staff to get money from a cash dispenser in the terminal building. You were escorted off the plane into the Vienna Airport, get your ATM money withdrawn. As soon as you had your money, you frog marched back to that aircraft, back, back to your seats, uh, told to put your belt on and stay still. Held to ransom, the dumbstruck passengers are then forced to collect the demanded money together to hand over to the cash-strapped airline. Yeah, so there's two people who uh, took the responsibility to collect the cash, one to make notes, um, to write the names down on a piece of paper and one collecting the money and then it was put into a carrier bag. We literally had to walk up and down the aisles. There's a lot of uh, noise going on because people were frustrated. There was a lot of people pretend pretending to be asleep who didn't want to put their hands in their pockets. People started to cry, they were melting down, saying, look, I haven't got the money, how am I going to go? How am I going to get back home to my family? And then other people, like there was a lot of good natured people there who actually could loan them the money and exchange numbers. And I hope all, all those people got their money back uh, because there was a lot of generous people on that flight. When we had, had the right of money, we were taking count on whom would give whom and we were, and we were adding all this up. Um, I then went to the, the lady's chief steward, who then in turn went to the captain who was hiding in the cockpit. We saw the pilot at the front counting the money and then he was happy. And once he had that, within minutes, the flight took off. It was sheer relief that we had left the tarmac of Vienna Airport and we were returning back to our own home country. The shaken passengers arrive at Birmingham International Airport to be met by relieved relatives and a media scrum. When we landed back into England um, and we came outside, when we'd gone through immigration, there was just so many people around there because news had got home what was happening. So there was TV channels, you know, news broadcasters, all waiting outside, family, friends. 
But despite the press interest in the story and promises from the airline to reimburse them, the unfortunate Comtel Air customers never do get their money back. Well, what we heard a few weeks later, the airline had gone bust. So that's it. So in that case, that, all our hopes of receiving any refund just went. So we'd lost our money. I still can't believe it actually happened. Like in this day and age, being, being um, asked to pay for fuel for a flight that you've already paid for, it was just an absolute disgrace, to be, to be honest. 22nd July 2013. After a catastrophic final approach, Southwest Airlines Flight 345 has made a crash landing at LaGuardia Airport. The plane has scraped over 2,000 feet along the runway before finally coming to a halt. But the passengers on board have no idea of the scale of the problem. Uh, I had suspected that we had a flat tire. Those tires probably burst it. Yeah, it's our phone right here. Thank you. People were making concerned noises. Uh, and then shortly after, we came to a stop. Uh, tires blew. This engine is on the ground. Here come the police. Everybody's instinct was to get out of your seats and get off the road. The landing gear is gone on this side. Uh, people were getting up to get their stuff, and then that's when they announced, please have a seat. We are not there. You need to take your seats. Please take your seats. And then I noticed a little bit of smoke in the front of the plane. Stay down. Stay down. Probably within 15 or 30 seconds, the smoke started coming into the, the cabin. As the smoke spreads throughout the plane and emergency exits are still not opened, the passengers start to panic. I'm thinking, oh my God, we're stuck in this tiny little space and I'm claustrophobic. And there was so much smoke and we couldn't see where the fire was coming from, but you could see them shooting the water back in the back, in the front, in the middle. There was smoke filling up the cabin. We needed to open doors and get people off the plane. After an agonizing wait, the crew finally opened one of the rear doors. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're actually evacuating the plane. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, come this way. Do not bring your big bags. Do not bring your big bags. You will not be able to get down the slide with them. Please. The flight attendants had opened the doors to allow people to get out, and they were trying to get us out through that exit. But because the plane has been torn to shreds and has skidded along the runway, passengers have just one escape route. Front doors were jammed. We could not use the doors on the wings because the turbines were still running, so they only opened one door. You can see people coming out of the back of the plane, uh, and the front door where we're sitting is still closed. Smoke is still in the cabin, and we're right there, and they haven't opened the door yet. I was thinking this can blow up at any given second. I don't want to stay here to find out. To his great relief, Franklin finally makes his exit down the rear chute, followed close behind by Aiden. They decided to throw me out of the plane, and the policeman grabbed me by the back of the neck and was pulling me and was yelling at me, and I was trying to explain to them that I was deaf. And I felt very alone. Franklin rushed to safety some hundred yards away from the plane and started filming the evacuation as the crew were at last able to release the front exit. So when they finally opened the door, it was kind of this sigh of relief, like, OK, we're going to get off the plane now. Nine people suffered minor injuries during the evacuation. After an internal review, the airline dismissed the captain and required the first officer to undergo additional training. And Armed Forces veteran Franklin has never really recovered from the experience. Coming out of the military, I saw things that most people don't see. As a result, I got out with a diagnosis of anxiety and panic attacks, which I, I think it has been made worse by this situation. <sighs> so in the fact that I had to worry about that particular issue on my own, now when I get on planes, it's tormenting and it doesn't stop. 
and you can't do anything about it. But again, I'm in no position to say no to work, so I just have to push through, and as they say in the military, suck it up and get it done. Other passengers of the ill-fated Flight 345 have had more success in coming to terms with their experiences on that day. We believe that even the worst situations um, can be beneficial. You can learn something from them. Since that moment, we've really tried to, to just look at our lives and say, okay, are we, are we really doing everything we're supposed to be doing? Because, I mean, it could have all ended that day. I would say my attitude about flying is the same because I'm a daredevil. <laughs> I've had so many experiences and this is just another one of them. I think the point is you have to enjoy your life. You never know what's gonna happen tomorrow or the next hour, the next day, the next minute. You just need to enjoy your life. 8th September 2015, Las Vegas McCarran Airport. British Airways Flight 2276 to the UK was aborted during takeoff when the left-hand engine burst into flames. As the fire raged, Captain Chris Henke and his 12 crew members have managed to get the 157 passengers to the safety of the airport terminal. The shaken travellers are now being attended to by the British Airways staff. Sure, this is younger than my daughter, and they was helping us, and they're coming, are you all right, are you all right? And I'm thinking, like, I should be looking after you, you're my daughter's age. There were a couple of the girls who'd only been in six months, so it's, you know, it's quite a shock to them, but uh, and the way they organised it and, and got everybody, you know, at the end, it was, it was tremendous, and they did, they did a, an excellent job. I think the cabin crew were excellent. Eventually, Captain Chris arrives in the terminal himself. The captain, and he just looked really like ashen and grey, you know, really stressed, worried, whatever. And somebody gave me a microphone and I just told them what had happened. We'd had a catastrophic failure. Uh, but I was pleased that everybody was off and OK. Everyone just gave him a massive round of applause. You know, we were so pleased that he got us off there so quick. I mean, everybody knows it's a safe way to travel, but when something like that happens to you, it uh, obviously makes you just makes your brain go into overdrive, doesn't it? You know. It's just I don't know. It's one of the hardest things I've ever had to go through in my life. I hope I never have to go through it again. BA had said just to say sorry for what had happened. Anywhere we go in the world, you can have a holiday. We chose to go to the Maldives, Constance Halavelli, and it was just unbelievable. My daughter said to me, Mum, out of something so bad, something so good's come out of it, because we did have an amazing holiday. 